Robin is the director of the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Um, some of you, possibly the older ones in the audience, will remember Jimmy Reid as a great trade union leader from the 70s, um, sadly deceased, and um, the Jimmy Reid Foundation was set up in his memory to try and achieve the things that he was aiming for in his lifetime. So without further ado, please welcome Robin McAlpine. <laughs> Yeah, can I just start by saying whoever invented the breakfast meeting deserves to be shot in the head. Breakfast is for a cup of tea in your cornflakes. And can I secondly say um, that I totally want to back what Ross said about not waking up on the 19th. For God's sakes, folks, stay up all night. What are you going to tell your grand -wains? What did you do on the 18th? Oh, I was in bed with a cocoa by 10. This is the chance. This is the opportunity to remember every single minute of it. But mainly, I'm going to talk about imagining a better Scotland. Because I've spent my whole life imagining a better Scotland. And there's one thing I want to tell you, I can guarantee you, will mean we don't get it. And that's doing nothing. Because to be quite honest, in terms of a lot of the big issues, collectively, in the UK, we've been doing nothing about it for my whole life. So, you've heard a lot of these stats before, but they're really worth bare retreat, repeating. Fourth most unequal country in the world. Of advanced economies, Britain is the second lowest pay economy of the lot of them. Uh, we have the highest level of disabled poor in Europe. We have one of the lowest productivities of an advanced economy, one of the worst balance of trade. We are one of, the, of, of all the advanced economies of all the OECD countries, we are one of only two who saw a drop in industrial production over the 30 years. Um, other countries were hitting 50 and 100% increase in their industrial production over that time. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a worker, it's worth bearing in mind the fact that if you rank every country of the EU 27 in order, according to who's got the most industrial democracy at their work, we come 26. So the slogan should really be better together, brackets, than Lithuania. That's the only country in Europe who's got worse workers' rights than we have. These things are all linked. It goes like this. If you don't have a voice at your work, if you don't have strong trade unions, and if you allow an economic system in which people who work have no say and no control over their lives, you will get a low-pay economy. When you get a low-pay economy, you will get an unequal economy. When you get an unequal economy, you will get tax problems. Because if you don't have people earning money, if you have people living in poverty, they can't pay tax. If they can't pay tax, you have bad public services. So let's just have a look at the size and the shape of this problem. In Scotland, let's imagine there's a kind of a decent salary. Let's call it a decent salary. You can live on it, you can feed your family, you can pay your taxes, you can participate in society, you know, you can even shop. Um, let's say that salary is something like 25,000 to 35,000 pounds. In Scotland today, of everybody who's in work, only one in five people earn between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds. Three out of five earn less than 25,000 pounds, and half of the people in work in Scotland now earn less than 21,000 pounds. Now, let's say it wasn't like that. Let's say we weren't rubbish, because you're going to find there's a bit, of a, a bit of a common theme here. We are rubbish. We are not doing well. Let's say we weren't. And I'm not going to talk tonight about Nordic stuff, because Leslie's coming on next, and she's the real expert. But let's say that we had um, not a bigger GDP, not a richer country, but a country that simply distributed its wealth better. Let's say we had the kind of pay that they've got in a Nordic country and the number of people who are in employment that they've got in a Nordic country. We did this, and we remodelled what it would mean for tax. Without touching tax rates, without shifting tax rates at all, simply by making the Scottish people richer, we would generate £4 billion of additional tax. £4 billion. And that, in the worst-case scenario, is what some people are saying might be the tax gap if everything goes really bad with North Sea oil. We just have to fix our economy. Our economy is dreadful. We have very little productive enterprise. We have almost no serious large-scale manufacturing left. Whenever we get some decent large-scale manufacturing, our economic strategies don't really care. And I'll give you the example. Anyone in here who's um, specs 
because it likes a drink, might have good reason to be very grateful for the disposable contact lens I have. It just saves so much bother when you come in footing about with your contact lenses after a couple of beers. The um, disposable contact lens is the world standard. It was invented in Scotland by a Scottish company using £300,000 of public money and £100,000 of the money of the guy that started the company. When that company was at its peak in Scotland, it was employing a thousand people in good jobs, making these disposable contact lenses which they exported all around the world. Now, today, there's a hell of a lot more jobs in it than that, if you live in Vermont, because it was bought up in an equity takeover and we lost the company. Now, all of this is for one basic, simple reason. It all comes to the same thing. In my life, I'm 40, in my life in Britain, there has only ever been one dominant political philosophy, and it's a philosophy of conflict. If we take two people and put them in a room, whoever comes out alive is the only one that's got anything good to offer anybody. Now, that model applies to everything we do. You can do it in schools. They call it meritocracy. We will decide what the measure of who's the best kid is. By the time you're 16, whoever won that game that we set will have the chances for the rest of their life. And if you lose that game that we set, you're screwed. It's a conflict model. It works with business. Who's the most powerful? Who's got the most capacity to shove us around, to bend the tax rules, to lobby the government to get beneficial treatment? Who's the strongest? can be summed up roughly in the phrase, cherish the wealth creators. You must have heard that, the wealth creators. Don't we love the wealth creators? Because they're better than us. They're better than us and we know they're better than us because they've got money. And money is the universal sign of being better, according to this philosophy. So if these people have got lots and lots of money, they must have done something good. They must be better. So we should let them run the country because they're better than us. And that, in a nutshell, is how the UK runs. It's how we do it. Compare and contrast, um, Norwegian Prime Minister in the middle of what we call the financial crisis, what they call 2009, said um, to build more, we must share more. Now, let's stop and think about this idea for a second, because I know this is a lot of economics, but let me give you a simple way to think about it. Let's say you were running a nursery school. You wanted to get stuff built. What would your strategy be? Let the biggest wain shove the other wains out the road and grab the Lego? Doesn't work. Why does it not work? because the game becomes grabbing and hoarding Lego. You want to get stuff built? Share the Lego more evenly across the wains. Some of them will build wonderful things. Now that, in a very simple nutshell, is what we're trying to develop in the idea of common wheel politics. A politics which said you don't only get the best results by letting the most powerful dominate everything all the time. You get the best results if you find ways to share resource more evenly. Now, the statistics show this. You don't even have to go through the statistics. You know this in your head. You can think about this. You can think about these two nursery school classes. And you can think about what those classrooms look like. That first classroom looks like Britain now. A small number of people have grabbed everything. And it wouldn't even be so bad if they were doing something with it. But they're not. They're hoarding massive amounts of wealth at the very time when our economy needs a boost. And the second, second classroom, that's the one we could have. That's the Scotland we could build. And there's really only one message that I want people to get out of what I'm saying tonight, which is it can be better and we know how. We know how to get there. Because as I've shown again and again, to be worse would be damn hard if you're in Britain. To be worse at most of these things would involve you turning into a third world country. Now that's the reality of where we are. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Because there's an awful lot of people that are talking about, oh, can we afford it because of the oil? Can we afford it because... We shouldn't be thinking about yesterday and the tax receipts from yesterday or the economy of yesterday because it wasn't any good. We need to build, rebuild a decent economy in this country. And there are a number of ways that we can do it. First of all, we're going to have to be, get ourselves a decent industrial policy and stop believing that if we just sit back and again let the powerful dominate, somehow they'll fix the economy for us, because they won't. We need to start doing things. We need to start doing things like saying, if you want to build productive enterprise, and I should emphasise this here, when I say productive, that just means that you create value in the economy, that the work that you do creates value. The reality of much of the employment in Britain just now is that it doesn't create any value at all. So let's take retail. 
The value in retail is created by some poor lassie in a Chinese sweatshop who turns thread into cloth and cloth into push-up bras. That value is realised by putting all these things in a lorry and getting it driven to a container port, shipped over here and driven to depots. And it's realised by putting those products on the shelves and taking the money out of our pockets. No value created in the economy, lots of value sucked out of the economy. Because every penny of that profit came from your pockets and all you got back were a handful of low paid jobs. So you might have heard that regeneration through retail, regeneration through the service sector. Really? If retail cures poverty, why does it not do it in reality? Because we look, the second biggest retail destination in Britain is Glasgow, which is also the city with the highest volume of poverty. We need productive businesses that make things, that do things, that keep the value here, which create value. When you have value created in the country, suddenly your employees become worth paying because they're of value to, the, to you. They're not just stacking shelves and they're not just shuffling things around. They are your asset, and that's what we need to build. We need to build a Scotland based on that asset. So patient finance, um, a national investment bank that helps people set up businesses and accepts that if you're going to create a productive business, you're not making a profit in six months. You might not be making a, a profit in three years. Good, let's be patient. Let's wait for that and let's help people to build these businesses. Let's keep these businesses here. Because um, we are one of only three countries in the whole European Union that does not have legislation which is about putting workers on the boards of companies. It's an incredibly important thing. In Denmark, 65% of every business with 500 employees or over gives over a fully a third of the board of directors to employees. And what do you know? The productivity, the quality of those businesses is miles ahead of ours. Because what they create is a workforce where the workers and the employers are working together in a mutual enterprise, not in a conflict model where they're trying to fight each other down to lower wages. We do not need any more Grangemouths. We do not need any more businesses in which crushing the pay of the workers, keeping them as low pay as you can get away with, is the strategy for business. It's no good for any of us. It's not good for, it's not good for the, the country. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for public services. It's not good for you. So we need to build this economy, and there's lots of other things we can do. I won't go into any of those just now. And once we've got that economy, once we've got a productive economy with well-paid people, then we can do amazing things, genuinely wonderful things, like building on the welfare state that we've got. And can I just say that the universal welfare state is, to my mind, the greatest achievement that's ever been created by civilization. To say at a national level that we will take from each according to ability to pay and give to each according to need, and to banish the fear of illness, to banish the fear of ex the, the kind of poverty that leads you, leads you to death, to banish the fear that you're going to be safe and secure in your life, and to do that between us collectively as an agreement is an amazing thing. And this welfare state, our greatest achievement, genuinely is under threat. And all I hear is, how do we reform it? And by reform it, they mean cut it. So I say, how will we reform it? And by reform it, I mean build on it. We are about, the, again, in Europe, we are the country with just about the worst childcare provision, which is another reason why we've got a bad economy. It's a statistic I saw in the Financial Times, and I didn't believe it at first, but it is true. The difference between the participation of women in the Norwegian economy and the participation of women in the UK economy is worth more to Norway than its oil wealth. I know this is a, a, a startling statistic. If Norway was to lose all of the women in the labour force that we've lost, that would cost them more than oil, all their oil reserves. A large part of that is because we have no infrastructure to help women get back into work properly because we don't take childcare seriously because, once again, somebody somewhere in Westminster decided that that wasn't really what we need to do. Well, that is what we need to do, and we need to do it now. We need to start building in this welfare state because the welfare state creates the social cohesion that creates the country that we want to live in. We need to decentralise. It is an absolute disgrace that a town the size of Kirkcaldy 
And while I never came from here, my right-hand um, woman at my work for six years was a Cordy woman, um, so I am a little bit scared coming up here. But um, she always gave me a sense of a town with a real sense of community. And you have no democratic right to make decisions about your community. You don't have your own town council. You can't, between you, if every single person in this town voted to put a plaque up on a wall, you wouldn't necessarily get it because we don't have proper democracy. Now, this is the key thing, because in everything that was achieved in 1945, the Labour government, I mean, it was an amazing period. It was, they did amazing things. And if they'd done one thing more, which was to take the decision-making processes and move it out of the hands of that group of the elite in London who continued to run the economy even after it was nationalised, they could have taken that decision-making process and spread it out. We wouldn't be where we are we wouldn't have had that slow creep of recapture of the state by the people who are not us. But that's what happened. So as we do this, we need to redistribute power because right now our battle is power against people. The power of corporations, the power of multinationals, the power of vested interests. And the only thing that can hold that to account is us. It's power versus us, power versus democracy. We've got to get those decisions back where we can keep an eye on them. And so forget any arguments that I've made here. Well, don't. But forget any arguments I've made here suggesting that I'm only supporting independence purely on the basis that I am absolutely confident that we can start building a better economy and a better society. I would believe it to be the right thing to do anyway because the closer we take our decisions to the people that they affect, and the, more importantly, the more that we help them keep those decisions to account, the better those decisions will be. Now, there's a whole load more to this idea of commonweal that we're developing. So we've got industrial democracy paper coming out, a welfare paper coming out. We've just put a paper out saying, oh dear God, let's take energy back into collective ownership. Cut your bills by 20%. <laughs> it wouldn't cost us anything and it would cut your bills by 20% and all the profits of Scotland's energy would come back to Scotland because we need to make better use of our own natural resources for us, not for some Chinese multinational sticking up wind turbines. But I, I guess the last point that I really want to make about this is to do with, so it's, it's slightly technical, so bear with me for a second. You might have heard people talking about populism. The SNP government, um, there's things about which I would criticise it, but sure as hell not for keeping medicine free, keeping education free, and for keeping um, care for the elderly free. And yet this is called, and yet this is called populism by some of those who would really like to see our society wound down. Of course, not for the first time, they don't understand the word. Populism is not a phrase, it's not a word that comes from the root popular. It doesn't have nothing to do with popular. Populism comes from the root populace. It's a political doctrine which says to manage a big group of people, the easiest thing to do is to divide them in two bits, a big bit and a small bit, then make the big bit hate the small bit. And as all that internal hating's going on, we can get on with running things as we want. Which is why, right now, in a period when our elite crashed our economy and left us working people in Scotland with massive debts lying on our back, they have got us blaming the poor. They have got us blaming the disabled, dear God. I, spoke, I spent a morning with a disabled group in Leith, and I came away in a state of shock. The treatment and the abuse that has been directed toward the disabled in this country. Never mind, never mind the immigrants who came to this country wanting to contribute. These are not the people that we should be hating. Because who's the people that we should be hating? Nobody. Enough now. The politics of hate has served us dreadfully. We are a society of people who may be right and who may be wrong. We may not all agree, but my God, we are one society and one community. And we need a politics that brings us back together again, that connects us again, that doesn't set one against the other, employee against employer, um, poor against rich, man against woman. We need a politics that brings us back together. We need to take our interests, all of our interests, and coincide them. Because, let's be honest, the Scottish business person has largely been screwed over as much as the Scottish taxpayer. They haven't had a good break out of Westminster politics either. So let's bring these agendas together and create a politics that unites. Because while I hate, hate populist politics, there is nothing wrong with popular politics. There is nothing wrong with our politics communicating to people again. 
Those who run the show just now are quite happy with the in-between elections for five years, we stay out the way. It's time we got back in the way again. And it's time we got back in the way by making politics popular and by talking about it again. And so, in doing this, I just want to tell you what we are calling the project, the Commonwealth project, how we're phrasing this now. Because we've got a strap line. I'll tell you right now. We have, uh, we've got a politics which you can best describe as me first. And we've got to change it. We need a politics which is all of us first. A change in the political landscape in this country which can change people's lives for real. Imagining a better Scotland has been fun for the last 40 years. We need to be realistic that for small steps, which is a one vote on one day, we can take the power to stop imagining it and start building it properly. Thanks.